All right, we're going to talk about uh, Noah some more tonight. So we're going to get into this. Um, do you, you ever had those situations in your life where um, you mess up real bad? That ever happened to you? And you kind of just feel like out there and you're just hoping like, it's worse when you mess up real bad and it affects a whole bunch of other people. That ever happened to you before? And you're just thinking like, oh, what if they find out it was me that messed this all up? <laughs> What if you find out? What if you find out? You know, what if you're that one person? <laughs> Man, that just brings me back to failure. I don't want to think about it too much. I, I remember we were, when I was working retail, there was a profit sharing program. If you did certain things and you got your everything done, and one of them was, uh, you know, you had, you had all your orders in on time. It was a weird thing, but anyway. And uh, I was the one guy who, mess, who got an order in late that quarter. And so our store didn't get profit sharing. But I had a manager. Yeah, I felt really bad. I really did. And uh, my manager, I don't think felt bad was the word I would use, but um, she covered me. And she had grace. Because I had done it right so many times, but I messed this up. And you walk out and you just think, everybody's going to wonder. Everybody's going to look at me and you feel exposed. Have you ever felt that way before? You just feel like exposed, but if you have someone in your life who will cover you, say, look, it's okay. We'll get it next time. I don't know what feeling you like more, like exposed or covered. Like it's going to be all right. This is, this is an option that we have in our life, and we get to do this for others. And I want to talk about a story here in Genesis. Now, last week, I, first of all, I did not lie to you. I was just going to say that. All right. I told you what I was going to preach on this week, and I'm not going to. It wasn't a lie. I intended to. In fact, I intended to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and it wasn't working. I just prayed, and it felt like the Lord called me to just continue on in a different section. Now, I will say I didn't want to preach this text today because it's weird. <laughs> That's just the reality of this is a weird story, and I have said too many times, don't skip the hard parts. <laughs> and the Lord, I'm like, Lord, and, and I felt like the Lord said, don't skip the hard parts. And I'm like, ugh, it's that practice what you preach thing, right? And so I was going to talk about the connection between the return of Christ and Noah. And I just want you to know, we're still going to talk about that, but it's going to actually be part of our next sermon series. We're going to wrap back into Noah in the next sermon series so you just have to wait on that, but we'll get back there. So instead, we're going to look in Genesis chapter 9. Now, this series is called The Reset, and we're looking at the flood and what God did through Noah in doing the world's very first reset. And, and if this is your first time, our theme for the year is reset. We believe God is resetting some things in our life, that he's going to reset marriages, and he's going to reset uh, parenting. He's going to reset relationships. He's going to reset finance. He's going to reset our nation. He's going to reset our culture. He's going to reset the church that God is doing a new work, a new thing. And so we're looking here in the book of Genesis at the very first reset. And we're going to look in Genesis 9. Now, again, I warn you, I'll say it again, this is weird. And we'll get into why in just a moment. You won't have to ask. So before we get into this in Genesis 9, we're going to start here in, I believe, verse 18. I left off last week talking about the covenant and the rainbow. And between that verse 17, where we left off in Genesis 9, there's a large gap of time in between verse 17 and verse 18. And we'll, we'll see that as we get into this. Big gap of time. In fact, there was enough time. Uh, for Noah to plant a vineyard and have a harvest, there was enough time for uh, Noah's sons to have several children. So this wasn't just like, and God said, here's my covenant with you, and then we get to this. This was years later. But this is the next story that the Holy Spirit gives us in the Word of God. And I read this a lot of times and said, why is this here? Well, we're going to discover that tonight. There's a really good reason why this is here. Genesis 9, starting with verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. 
He drank of the wine and he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. Isn't that just a nice, polite way? Naked is the word we're looking for. This guy, this is the man who the Lord considered righteous and I will save the whole world. If you ever feel like you're failing and you're messing up, just go back to Noah. God chose this guy to save the entire world through, all right? He gets drunk. He's naked in his tent, and it says in verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, walked backward, and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine, (laughs) okay, Noah was passed out. (laughs) That's the word we're looking at, all right? This was, like, we just had a great section about the covenant of God, where now we get this. He's passed out, and he wakes up, and he he knew, or he heard, or something about what his youngest son had done to him. And he says this, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. This is our text, and I'll read the last two verses. I don't have them up here. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years. Okay. I don't want you to, like, think too hard about this. It was like a 600-and-some-year-old naked man in a tent. <laughs> he was really old. Really old. I, it, it, what, a, what a strange thing. Now, I'm sorry, but, like, as someone who preaches the Word of God, sometimes you look at this and you go, why, oh, Why? Is this, and then really, why God do I have to preach this? But there is a purpose, I promise. It's profound. We just got to get into it. All right, what does this tell us that's important? Okay, so here's my questions when I look at this text. The first question that I have to ask myself, I've already said, why is this in the Bible? That's the first question. When I get past that, the second question I have is wait a minute, Noah was obviously in sin getting drunk and, getting, and passing out in his tent. That was, the Bible talks about not being drunk. Why, why isn't that mentioned? Why wasn't he punished by God? And the answer to that is, I don't know. The ans- here's the thing. He might have been punished by God, and the text doesn't mention it, but we really just, we don't know. And what we find in this text is there's actually a lot of details that are left out of what happened. There's clearly more to this story. There's more to this story, but this was what we know, which brings me to the third question, which is the elephant in the room. What in the world did Ham do that was so heinous that it caused a curse on his heritage? Also, I don't know. We don't know. There's a lot of theories out there, and there's some different opinions, but here's what I do know is that theories aren't facts. All right, and so I have to stick to the facts. Here's what I do know is that Ham dishonored his father. He dishonored him, and that is clear, and that's all we know. It seems as though something happened. We don't know what it is, but we know that it was bad enough that there was a curse spoken on to him. So let's get into the the text a little bit and figure out what's going on here. I believe that in God's word, this is a, do you believe this is inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? So Genesis was written by Moses, and there was a reason, I believe, that God that the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to put this specific text in our Bibles with this specific detail, just the important parts. So let's start with this response to Noah's sin, and then we're going to look at Noah's response. So there's two responses that we see, two responses. The first response is to expose, to expose, to make an announcement. Hey guys, guess what? Dad's naked and he's passed out. For everyone to hear. This is the exposing. This is, he probably ridiculed his father. We do this naturally, don't we? Like, this is the only reason America's Funniest Home Videos, that's still on? Like, how is that still on? Like, we just have YouTube now. But this show, this is a show, I'm sure you've all seen America's Funniest Home Videos, right? It's a show in which you sit on your couch and you laugh when people trip and fall and when dads get hit in the crotch with a baseball. Like, this is the show. That's like the entire premise of the show. 
is people doing dumb things and then laughing at those dumb things. It's part of our nature. It's part of what we do is when somebody does something dumb, you laugh. In fact, you can be out playing and you go, oh, oh I'm sorry, are you okay? Right? And then you, you realize that they might actually be hurt. Have you done this? Be honest. You've laughed first and had compassion second. You're a sinner too. It's just part of our nature. It just is what it is. He dishonored his father. And this is really what he was doing was he was passing judgment on Noah. That he was judging him for his sin. Now there is one judge, and that is not us. And so we aren't to be the ones who judge others' sins, but that's what he did. And that was the first response, to expose. The second response was simply to cover. And this is what the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth, did, is they took a different approach. They covered their father, and in doing so, they honored him. That he was in a vulnerable place, in a vulnerable state, and they chose to cover him and honor him, even though he brought this upon himself. They responded with grace. I think it's pretty clear when we look at this, if you were to ask this question, did Noah fail here? Yes. Noah absolutely failed. We all fail. Noah failed in this situation, but his sons, these two sons, chose to cover him with grace. And you know what I find interesting about this is that this is exactly what Jesus does for us, is that when we fail, when we are in our sin, he doesn't expose, he covers. This is the kind of God he is. In our sin, he covers us. In our guilt, he covers us. When we feel shame, he covers us and he takes away our shame. And so there's really just two responses. This is simplistic, but there's really just two responses when you see someone else mess up in your life. Now, you may have no one in your life who ever messes up. Anyone? You live as a hermit and you've never interacted with people. That's the only way. Otherwise, there's someone in your life who has messed up. In fact, they might have messed up on the way to church. <laughs> and then you smiled and were happy. What's our response? It's, it's, you know what? Relationships are better on Saturday night church because you don't have that morning, Sunday morning scramble. It is better relationally for the church, I think, to not have to get up early and do, okay, sorry. What's our response when someone messes up in our life? This is the question I, I wonder. When someone makes a mistake, I promise you someone will fail you. Someone will make a mistake. Someone will make a decision that is not a good one. It's potentially destructive. Are you ham or are you the Shem and Japheth? What are you? See, now what I'm not saying is that, well, you just kind of cover them. Sin shouldn't have any consequences. No, sin does have consequences. In fact, the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. So ultimately, you live in a lifestyle of sin, then death is that consequence. But at the end of the day, as Jesus' people called to be like Jesus, we are to be a people who cover, not to be a people who expose. That when there is someone who fails in our life, when there is someone who fails around us, we are to be a people who cover, a people who forgive, a people who extend grace, people who don't keep a record of wrongs, people who live the gospel of Jesus Christ through our actions. This is what we're called to do, is to be a people who will cover when someone else has failed. How can we cover someone? Well, it says in 1 Peter 4, 8, it says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. There's just two, those, two, those two responses, expose and judge or bring grace and love. That's what it is. That's what we do. I promise you, you will have someone fail you. What do we do as a response? Do we, expo do we pour out grace upon them? Do we say, I love you, and we're going to get through this? Or do we, do we keep that record? Do we, do we take notes and say, all right, that's strike 14. When we get to strike 20, and then you get to 20, all right, that's 21. When we get to, and you just have this whole record. 1 Corinthians 13 says that love doesn't keep a record of wrongs. That when we cover, when we forgive, we let go. And so we have two different results. 
two different results from choosing to judge and expose, which produces really bad fruit, or we have to cover and to love and to have grace, and that produces a completely different set of outcomes in our life. And we'll see from Noah what these outcomes were. Now, Noah makes a statement. It's a very strong statement, but here's what I need you to know. This is not just a statement. It's actually a prophecy. This is a word of prophecy that we see in Genesis 9, one of the very first words of prophecy in the Bible. And this is actually an amazing word of prophecy. This word of prophecy actually, I want you to know, includes you. This word of prophecy encompasses the story of the entire Bible, and it points all the way through Jesus to you. Let's look at it. The first part is this, Canaan's curse. The first thing that we see is that he says, cursed be Canaan. Now, he prophesies that Canaan will be a servant to his brothers. Now, one of the things as we read the scripture that we look at is, okay, who's the one who messed up? Was it Canaan? Who was it? It was his dad, Ham. He's the one who exposed. He is the one who dishonored his father. And yet, here it says, Cursed be Canaan. Now, in our text, it's interesting. I started to pick up on some hints on this because as I was reading through on verse 18, and it's talking about the different sons, for some reason, it was important to tell us that Ham was the father of Canaan. And then again, a little farther down, it says that Ham was the father of Canaan. So maybe this is about Canaan and not so much about Ham at this point. Clearly, He's trying to tell us something about Canaan. Now, you might ask yourself, and I ask myself, why in the world didn't Noah curse Ham? He blessed Shem and he blessed Japheth. Why, why wouldn't he curse Ham? Well, he couldn't. He actually couldn't because in Genesis 9-1, and we looked at this two weeks ago, I think, it says, and God blessed Noah and his sons. See, the blessing of the Lord was already on the sons, and it wouldn't be undone. So the consequences of the father's actions fell upon his descendants and said. Now, the line of Canaan, this is interesting, the line of Canaan would become servants to his brother's descendants. Here's who some, I'll just tell you a few of the descendants of the line of Canaan. The Canaanites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Hittites, there's a lot more. Do you recognize any of those names? All right. Who were those people? Who were they in relation to the Israelites? Right? The enemies. These are the enemies of God's people. This is who the descendants of Canaan became. Canaan's descendants were the enemies of God's people. Just as the prophecy had spoken that there was, his line would be cursed, they occupied the territory that God had promised his people. And so when we get to the promised land, y'all, the Israelites, they didn't make all the right choices in their lives either. After wandering around in the desert for 40 years, it was time God was going to give them the promised land. And if you look all the way forward to Joshua chapter 6, the Israelites show up in a land, and that land is called Canaan. They show up in the land of Canaan to the most prominent city in the land of Canaan, and that city was Jericho. And Jericho was the very first city. In fact, it was the mightiest city in the land of Canaan. And this land of promise, God said, would need to be cleared of evil if they were going to occupy it. And so the Israelites would go in, they would conquer the land of Canaan, and any Canaanite whose life was spared was made a servant to the Israelites. And so, wait a minute, (laughs) I thought Canaan was going to serve his brothers, Let's go back to this. So here we have the descendants of Canaan serving the Israelites. Now let's look here, the God of Shem. He says, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. So the next thing Noah declares is a blessing to the God of Shem. This was a prophetic statement that Shem's line would be God's chosen people. That God would be the God of Shem. Eight generations later, if you want to look forward in Genesis uh, chapter 11, you can read through this genealogy, if genealogies are something that are really exciting for you to read, but they do give us information. You look forward, and what you see is that eight generations after Shem, a man named Abram would be born. 
And God had relationship with Abram, changed his name to Abraham, and God promised a heritage through Abraham. Abraham had a son named Isaac, who had a son named Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Israel. So it was through Shem's line that we see as we read the genealogy in Genesis 11, you'll see that it was through Shem's line that the Israelites were born. And Noah prophesied it right here in Genesis chapter 9, that God would be the God of Shem. And God would bless Shem generation after generation after generation and generation. His descendants would call upon the name of the Lord. They would be the ones that would walk with God. They would be led by him. They would worship him. God's people, the Israelites, the descendants of Shem. And so now we've got, this is prophecy by Noah is already playing out. You've got the Canaanites who are now servants of the Israelites. You have Canaan's descendants serving Shem's descendants, just as Noah said would happen. But then you have Japheth. Japheth, he says, may God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Now, we'll call this Japheth's expansion because Japheth's name literally means expansion. That's what his name means. And so he says to him that God would enlarge or expand the territory of Japheth. That's the prophecy that he would uh, enlarge Japheth's territory, that God would do an increased work in Japheth and his descendants. This was not a work for now, but it was a work for later. If you've ever tried to grow something, you know that it takes time. My process of growing something is plant something, let it grow a little bit, kill it, plant another one, let it grow a little more, kill it, and eventually, maybe by the third time, it actually grows enough, and then we get excited, and there was no fruit that bared, or the tomatoes just didn't, something didn't happen. My soil composition must have been off. But anyway, that's my own personal problems. If you can counsel me, great. Here's the deal. When you grow something, it takes time. Like, this was an expansion. This was a growth work. This wasn't an immediate work. This was something that God was going to do later through Japheth. We saw Canaan and Shem, that happened relatively quickly in the story of the Bible. But the story of Japheth, well, that doesn't happen for quite some time. What, who are the descendants of Japheth? And what is this expansion that is prophesied? Why don't you just turn the page if you need to, or go to Genesis 10.5. We're going to look at this. We have to look at Genesis 10 to figure out who the descendants of of Japheth were because so far Noah's two for two on this prophecy. Let's see if he can be three for three. It says in Genesis 10 5, from these coastland peoples, now he's, this is the, again, the genealogy, the lineage of Japheth. It says in verse two, the sons of Japheth, and it lists them all. Verse five, from these coastland peoples spread their land, in their lands, each with his own language, by their clans in their nations. Did you get it? Okay, no, we got to dig a little more. That's what you got to do in the Bible. You got to dig. This word nations is translated. Does anyone have a King James Bible or a new King James Bible? Yeah. Okay. What is the last few words of that? Can you just tell us? Is that what? Yeah. Is that what it says? King James? Uh, did you hear a different word? Did you hear that word in there? Gentiles. You see, the word for nations that is translated here in the version I'm reading, the English Standard Version, is the word goi. It's the Hebrew word goi, G-O-W-Y. And this word is literally translated Gentile in Hebrew. And it is in hundreds of times in the Old Testament. It is the word for Gentile. Now, is anyone here Jewish? I'm just curious. Like you were born and you were Jewish? All right, so is anyone in here a Gentile? <laughs> That's all of you, <laughs> right? So you have the Jews and you have the Gentiles, and it says that from the line of Japheth came all of the Gentiles. So from Shem's line came the Israelites, from Canaan's line came the servants of the Israelites, and from Japheth's line came the Gentiles. This is where the prophecy includes you. You see, it says here, let him dwell in the tents of Shem. What are the tents of Shem? Well, the tents of Shem was the habitation of God. You remember, God 
dwelt among the Israelites in a tabernacle. It was the tabernacle that the glory of the Lord dwelt. It was among the praises of these people that God would inhabit. This is where his presence was, was with Shem in the tabernacle, in the tents of Shem. And through Jesus, the presence of the Lord was made available, not just to the descendants of Shem, but then to the descendants of Japheth as well. You see, it was an expansion. Because of Jesus, you can declare what David declared in Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, Noah spoke the story of the Bible in Genesis chapter 9, and we have been invited to dwell in the presence of God. We have been invited, us who came from the line of Japheth, we have been invited to dwell in the tabernacle. In fact, God has made you the tabernacle now. But we dwell in the tents of Shem. We get to be in the presence of God. We're brought in among the tents to worship Him, to be known by Him, to be led by Him. We've been included. Aren't you grateful that you've been included? You've been included to be healed. You've been included to be restored and set free. You've been included to be made whole, a Gentile like me, like you. This is the story of the Bible. But here's what's really cool. God's still doing the expansion work. He's still enlarging Japheth's territory to this day. Because it was promised here, it was prophesied, and God is still expanding Japheth's territory, but it's through you. It's through you. In fact, when you share the gospel with someone and they receive Jesus, you're fulfilling Genesis chapter 9. All the way back at the beginning, you're fulfilling this prophecy. You're enlarging the territory. You're expanding the kingdom of God. This really weird story. Who would have thought that God's entire plan was in those few pages, in those few paragraphs. That is how incredible the Holy Spirit has weaved together the Scriptures. See, you get to expand the kingdom of God. You are called to expand in the kingdom of God, and it's because of grace, because you were included. Just as Noah's sin was covered, I got some good news. Your sin's covered. You are covered. Just as Japheth was included, you're included. You get to be a part. God imparted that covering to you, and then he calls calls us to impart that covering to others. It begins with the pouring out of his grace upon our lives and then through us to the lives of others. That others would be restored. That others would be redeemed. That others would be set free and made whole. It lives on and on and on. And God is building his church. He's building his church through you. Through you. Isn't that amazing that you can say, I get to be a part of fulfilled prophecy in scripture all the way back from the very beginning. Because you can expand the territory. And God has called us to. I want you to think about that this week. Man, God, how would you use me? to expand Japheth's territory even today, all these thousands of years later. But maybe before you get there, we need to take a step back and start asking ourselves some other questions. God, how can I be someone who covers? How can I be a person of grace? How can I be a person of forgiveness and and be in a position like Shem and Japheth were in that tent that night? Would you stand with me? I want to pray over you, and we're going to respond. I believe that this is a call. This little passage of Scripture is a call to go do the work of Jesus. That if we are going to have a desire in our lives to grow to be more like Christ, then we must grow in grace. We must grow in forgiveness. We must grow in speaking the word of God and sharing the gospel and living the gospel in action. Do you believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life? Then we live it. 
Do you believe that it's by grace that you have been saved? Do you believe that? Anyone? Yeah? Well, maybe there's someone in your life who needs to be saved by your grace. I don't mean like you're going to save them like Jesus saved them, but I mean you're going to choose grace instead of exposing. This is the way of Christ. This is the way of Christ that we learn about all the way back in Genesis chapter 9. I want to pray for you because I believe that there are some here who are struggling with this, and I also believe there's some here that you're in a place, you come in here and you say, you know what, I need that grace today. I need to be covered. I feel exposed. I feel like I walked in here, I've got some shame, and I need God to come and cover me. Would you close your eyes? Lord God, we come before you. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are one who covers. That we have been covered by your love. That we have been covered by your mercy. We have been covered by your grace. We come before you today and we receive that grace. We receive that forgiveness. And if we are in this place tonight where we are stuck in shame, we are stuck in a pattern, we're, we're stuck in this place where we just feel exposed in our sin, we ask that you would come and cover us and wash us clean and forgive us, Lord God, and pour your grace out upon us and set us free, Lord God, that we would go and live a different way from this day forward. Lord, would you show us how to live out the legacy of Japheth in our lives to, to be a people who enlarge the territory of God. God, we live in a world, you know, God, we live in a world who desperately needs the kingdom of God to be expanded. It is needed that it is the people of God that will come with love and will come with grace, will come with that covering and will shift the atmosphere and the culture of this world that we live in. God, we need your kingdom to be enlarged. And so, God, we say tonight, let it start with me. Let it start with me that I choose you every day. That I would wake up in the morning and I would say, Jesus, I choose you today. I choose your ways today. And God, would you give us as a church an opportunity to cover others, to bring the truth and love and grace of Jesus to those around us. We're yours, God. We're yours. We surrender to you. We love you, Lord. We just pray, Lord God, that you would come and bring healing tonight in this room. That you would bring healing tonight in this place. Psalm 34, 18, 17 and 18 says, When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears, and he delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And Lord, we pray that for anyone who is in that place tonight, crushed in spirit, for anyone who is brokenhearted, for anyone, Lord God, who feels like they're walking through a season right now of affliction, Lord God, we pray for your comfort. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would bring healing, Lord God, that you would bring deliverance to those places, Lord, that you would come and bring your love to those places, Lord God. Lord God, we want to be a people who are whole who put our trust and our faith and our hope in you. And when we go out into this world, Lord God, the world will see the work that you've done in us for your glory. We come before you, Lord God, and we declare we need you. We need you. Come and cover us, God. Come and cover us again. Today, Jesus, we pray. Let's sing together. You can have it.